Okay, hello again, and welcome to today's webinar titled Mobile, the Achilles Heel, or the Key to Digital Transformation. My name is Will Bernholtz, and I'm the VP of Marketing here at DropSource, and I'll be your host and moderator today. I'd like to quickly go over a few housekeeping items to make sure we're all set up for success in today's webinar. Today's webinar will run, run for one hour and is set to end at 2 p.m. today. Please note that today's webinar will be recorded and a recording of this webinar will be sent via email to all attendees. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the webinar today, so you may put your questions into the Q&A widget that you see in your window and we'll have our expert panelists answer your questions live towards the end of our session. If you have any issues with audio or video, please just send us a chat or a question and someone from our team will work through that with you. Now I'd like to introduce you to our expert panelists for the day. First, we're very excited to have our featured guest panelist from Forrester Research, where he is the Vice President and Principal Analyst, Jeffrey Hammond. Jeffrey, it's a pleasure to have you here. Hey, Will, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Next, I'm pleased to introduce our other panelist, DropSource CEO, Ben Saren. Thank you, Ben. It's a pleasure to have you here with us today as well. Well, thank you, Will, and also a special thank you to Jeffrey for joining us today. And uh, thank you to everyone joining us uh, as attendees from all around the world. This is going to be fun. Yes, it will be. Lastly, I'm your host and moderator, Will Bernholtz, Vice President of Marketing at DropSource. Now I'd like to briefly tell you about our company that's hosting the webinar today, DropSource. DropSource is ushering in the next generation of mobile application development solutions. Our visual development platform empowers digital leaders and enterprise developers to build powerful, data-driven, and truly native mobile apps with unparalleled speed and flexibility. You can seamlessly connect with any REST API enabling apps to connect to nearly any business system or database. Best of all, DropSource outputs truly native, computer-generated Swift and Java source code with the click of a button. Updated, error-free, and compliant source code is just a click, of a, a click away, providing easy updates and peace of mind in this increasingly complex mobile-first world. We're also very proud to say that DropSource was recently named a strong performer in the Forrester way for mobile low-code platforms. Now, the great complexity of the mobile first world is something we're very familiar with, and it's what we're here to discuss today. So now I'd like to take you through the topics and agenda for our program. Digital leaders everywhere are asking themselves a big question. Are their mobile efforts opening doors for digital transformation or creating more challenges? It's a very good question and not always easy to answer. In today's webinar, we'll investigate this question the challenges faced by digital leaders surrounding mobile, an analysis of how they can respond, and using exclusive research data provide you with insights into the best practices for taking on digital transformation. As far as an agenda, here's what to expect. First, we'll dive into a panel discussion with our two expert guests centered around research recently published in the DropSource Digital Leader Survey Report and hear what analysis, takeaways, and opinions we can get from Jeffrey and Ben. Next, we'll then have an exclusive presentation from analyst Jeffrey Hammond as he goes through the data they gathered in the Forrester Global Mobile Executive Survey, and he'll discuss the challenges that digital transformation teams face in his work. After that, we'll hear from DropSource CEO Ben Saren as he outlines what we at DropSource are seeing in terms of how digital leaders are struggling with and overcoming mobile development challenges. Finally, we'll get you, our audience, involved and conclude the webinar with a live Q&A session with questions from you. So pl please do be sure to drop your questions into the Q&A chat widget during today's conversation. Now I'm excited to introduce our Digital Leader Survey report and moderate the discussion between our panelists. Our report, titled Mobile, the Achilles Heel of Digital Transformation, is based on research that we conducted in conjunction with Qualtrics where we surveyed more than 200 digital leaders at US-based enterprises of more than 500 employees. This was inclusive of 100 C-level executives, as well as heads of IT, innovation, digital, and mobile. Now, before we dive head first into the data, I thought it would be a good idea to start by defining at a high level what we mean when we say digital transformation. 
to help us here, we're lucky to have an expert panelist, Jeffrey from Forrester. And so I'd ask for him to provide his brief, brief perspective. Jeffrey, how do you define digital transformation? Hey, Will. Um, one of the things that I look at is it's not so much just updating your technology in the digital channels, you know, web and mobile and that sort of thing. I think it's really about adjusting your way of thinking. And when we talk about digital transformation at Forrester, one of the things that we tell clients all the time is that you have to put your customer at the center of your digital transformation efforts. So uh, technology in some respects is almost the last thing uh, that you focus on. So digital transformations are customer centric. Uh, as a result, you need to gather data about what your customers like and what they don't like. Your ability to act on that data at speed is one of the things that allows you to get in front of your competitors. And because of that, you have to create teams that are culturally agile and able to execute quickly uh, from a process standpoint. So digital transformation is about being customer led, insights driven, fast, and connected across all the different parts of your business. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, ben, anything you'd like to add? Um, yeah, thanks, Will. Um, I, I guess what I'll add is, is that I, I, you know, in sort of abstract terms, if you will, there, there was a time not too long ago that, you know, the technical skills that someone needed to perform their job were uniquely different. And those skills were greater than the technical skills that they employed in their non-work lives. So, you know, this was true whether you were a factory worker, a court stenographer, or a white collar executive. There was a time when employers, for example, wanted to know how fast you typed, how many words per minute. That needed to be on your resume. And while that seems almost funny today, it's a good example of the entirely unique skills that people needed in their work lives. And today, it's a totally different world. In fact, the technologies that we interact with every day at home and in our personal lives is arguably more sophisticated than the many technologies that we use at work. So the situation is almost completely reversed. In other words, in our everyday lives, we're speaking to our computers, we're accessing the internet in seamless ways across multiple devices, and uniquely we're engaging with technology during all our waking hours. We're speaking to Siri and Google and Alexa, running home automation technologies for our light bulbs, refrigerators, security systems, and depending on smart thermostats. And we're getting our entertainment fix in new ways too. So I think in many ways, businesses and companies are really behind the technology trends that we've grown accustomed to in our personal lives. So businesses and organizations of all kinds are behind the eight ball. And with the next generation coming up, they have a unique expectation that only digital transformation can deliver. Mm. Thank you both for that. Another term that we're using a lot here today that I think is worth defining is what exactly do we mean when we say digital leader? In our view, a digital leader is anyone in a role that oversees digital initiatives, innovation, execution, such as digital uh, chief digital officers as an example, but could include other roles too. Some involved in IT, but not specifically only IT. Primarily, digital leaders are those inside organizations undergoing digital transformation that place heavy strategic value on communication, creativity, and a willingness to explore how technology can be used to successfully address business challenges. Now, let's jump right in and take a look at what the research data we gathered this summer and this uh, earlier this year showed us about how mobile appears to be the Achilles heel to digital transformations. So according to our research, 62% of digital leaders say their progress towards digital transformation is mature, it's good news. But 84% also confess to being behind the eight ball with mobile. This creates a bit of a contradiction. Jeffrey, let's, let's start with you. What are these data points, and more specifically, what does the contradiction here signify to you? Well, I'll tell you, well, in some ways, uh, it's aspirational versus reality. And I see this uh, in other areas when, like, for example, we survey uh, technology professionals on their use of Agile. And in our most recent survey, over half said that, you know, 75% of their teams and their organization are using Agile. And yet, in my inquiries every week, I'm 
I'm working with them through the basics of scaling Agile and the challenges that they have. So I view their view on mobile as a specific aspect of their digital transformation and they're challenged the same way that they're challenged with agent technology, the same way that they're challenged with voice, the same way that they're challenged with uh, uh, making artificial intelligence uh, part of their strategy. The reality is, is if you've been in your position for any length of time, you don't want to go to the CEO and digital transformation is, is, a, is a boardroom topic and say, we're not mature. I mean, we'll imagine if you were about to go to Ben and say, hey, you know, our, our digital transformation is, is not mature. It would be a hard conversation to have because it would be some, but something that Ben would care very much about. So I think when you, when you really look at this, you have to probe underneath that, that, that maturity statement and look at specific practices, um, what folks are doing. And when it comes to mobile, we see a lot of barriers uh, that, that companies uh, struggle through. Uh, they are barriers with respect to talent. Uh, they are barriers with respect to process, uh, with the culture of how they deliver, and also with the technology. And it's only understanding the maturity of these sorts of, of next level down type of things that you get the honest admission of the challenges that organizations face. Mm -hmm. Ben, uh, what's your take? Yeah, um, I, I've had a lot of time to consider this data and, and like Jeffrey, I get a little hung up on, on the word mature. Um, what, is, what does that really mean? Uh, it, it's such a subjective word. I'd be really interested in understanding how the employees of those companies and perhaps more importantly, and to Jeffrey's point about customer centricity, how do the customers and the partners, how would they respond? So I, I suspect that there'd be a notable delta between what the digital leaders think and what these stakeholders think. Um, that's a suspicion though, I don't have any data to back that up. But what I'm really suggesting is, is that digital transformation, it's not a box to be checked, right? I mean, it's, it's never done. Saying that their progress is quote mature, I think implies that there's a cycle and that they're somehow over a hump um, or well beyond the hump, but with so much technological disruption on virtually every single front right now, that cycle is seemingly endless. So I'll, I'll just add this too. I, I think that a lot of digital leaders look at upgrading their systems to more contemporary backend systems or cloud-based systems um, as the biggest effort. And, and that's true, it's a lot of heavy lifting and that takes a battalion of people to see through, but that's just the start. How have those migrations, for example, made employees more productive? How is that manifested in terms of a user experience for customers? Um, delighted and retained more customers, perhaps. So how has the culmination of these efforts really put you ahead in your industry, put you ahead of your competition? And I think those are the results that I'd be looking for in really quantitative, but also qualitative ways. Well, very interesting takeaways. Thank you, gentlemen. And let's move on to the next data point. Our report showed that 46% of digital leaders have abandoned one or more mobile projects in the last four years with insufficient budget and unreasonable expectations as the top two reasons why. Ben, let me direct this question to you first. That's a lot of shelf projects. We can imagine these abandoned projects amounted to a good deal of wasted resources and lost potential gains. What would you say this represents? Yeah, um, uh, you know, I, I think I find myself getting stuck on another term here and it's that of quote, unreasonable expectations. So if we could kind of peel back the layers of that with those digital leaders, I, I think what we'd find is that there's a notably high degree of idealism when these companies first embarked on mobile app development. And I think as suggested in the data, um, they came to the realization that they've bitten off more than they can chew. They only realize at that point is at that point is to see it through and, and really stubbornly, or I think, you know, kind of cut your losses and, and even reassess. This is kind of reminiscent of what I remember seeing in the late 1990s or the early 2000s uh, with, you know, the ubiquity of the internet and the impact that it was having on businesses. There was this mad rush to, you know, quote, get on the web as companies said, we need email and we need a website and we need an intranet and extranet, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so it took, they took it upon themselves to hire experts and they outsourced with consultants to come in and, and, and check these boxes because there was this inflated sense of urgency. And I think hindsight being what it is, 
we know that deploying such assets in those ways was exhausting and it was often overcooked and didn't deliver on the promise or the hype. And it was putting the cart before the horse. Or in other words, more practically speaking, it was wasted money, time, and human resources. There were good lessons learned for sure, uh, but those were costly lessons. And I, I think we've seen this movie before and we're gonna see it again. Thank you, Ben. Jeffrey, for you, what are you seeing in your client interactions you deal with organizations of varying sizes as pertains to abandoned mobile projects? So, so I always tell my clients when it comes to building mobile apps and mobile experiences, you have to treat it as a marathon, not a sprint. And what I mean by that is I'll often see digital organizations that kind of look at, at what they're doing in the space uh, almost like they would a, a marketing campaign, you know, so they will build an application and maybe even treat it as a project. And then when the project's done or the funding runs out, it's like, what do you mean we have to update these apps? Uh, I saw a lot of that in the consumer product space uh, over the past couple of years, where especially in different countries, you'd have the local marketing organizations contract out with a local agency and they build an application around a certain brand and they'd launch it and they would declare victory. Well, you know, you are building products. And if they are done right, they are going to have a long lifespan. They're going to require regular updates. I usually tell folks that you need to plan uh, for the capability to do, you know, six to eight updates a year. Um, you know, if you look at your average consumer's mobile device, if you're lucky, you know, they have somewhere between 50 and 100 apps on it in average, and you've got to fight for a place uh, to be in number 50 or 100. So if you're creating six or seven applications uh, for that client, are you going to get that many slots uh, on their phone? So so, you know, if you've got a bunch of different efforts instead of, you know, a really coordinated focused effort, you know, kind of the, the equivalent of marathon training, it's easy to fail. Um, now, there are good failures, too. You know, when you can quickly do experiments, figure out what works and then respond, you know, based on customer feedback in the app store, uh, based on the uh, analytics and the telemetry that you've put in the application, and hopefully you're doing that, uh, then your ability to respond quickly and capitalize on opportunity and recover from failure can actually be a good thing. Just like when you're doing marathon training, sometimes you don't finish your long runs, and, and that's just as valuable an experience as, uh, as, the, uh, as the short jogs. So you've got to think of it as a marathon and prepare your execution uh, the same, with the same amount of deliberation. Otherwise, you end up with zombie apps, and the app store is full of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that really is something. It's, it's hard to imagine how big of an impact this might have on the bottom line. It's something for all digital leaders to watch for. Okay, moving on, I'd like to come back to something that we actually saw on a previous slide, which is that research showed, our research showed that insufficient budget and unreasonable expectations were highlighted by digital leaders as the biggest challenges they face in their efforts towards successful digital transformation and mobilization. The solutions to these challenges, most often selected by these same folks, were increased budget and increased hiring. First, Jeffrey, what do you make of the cohort that mentioned unreasonable expectations? That's obviously very subjective, but you know, what do you make of that? Well, I think a lot of it is is just you know a lack of understanding as to what the right mobile moments are and a real understanding of what customers will do and and what they will not do. So, as an example, um, why as a customer am I going to give you one of those fifty to hundred slots? What compelling value are you going to give me? Um, how are you going to make it worth my while to regularly engage? And how are you going to delight me with uh, regular new features and capabilities? Expectations shift over the time. So, you know, five years ago, it was just amazing that I could get an app uh, for my bank on the app site and I would, could, uh, you know, pay bills uh, and maybe do uh, a check capture uh, with my banking app. Uh, now I expect it to do everything. I expect it to be able to offer me fairly sophisticated planning advice for my retirement accounts that I have with the bank. Uh, I expect an agent that can advise me. I expect my monthly FICO score and, and, and updates there. So my expectations have shifted. And as a team, you've got to keep up with that. Okay, but now Ben, let me ask you, do you believe that throwing more money and people at the problem is the right strategy? Isn't this more of the same old approach? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you took the words right out of my mouth. I think the short and simple answer is no, definitely not. Um, allocating more human and financial resources and expecting different results is not a sustainable nor a scalable solution. Um, you know, I, I think the natural tendency that businesses have when these kinds of projects have two things working against it is first, the project might not have the right degree of executive buy-in. Um, sure, an executive team might support something, but are they really bought in? And I think that's a really critical point. Um, and furthermore, in my experience, a, a lot of executive teams only understand digital transformation in an abstract and conceptual way. They say, sure, yeah, it'd be nice to have a mobile app for our customers, but they view it as exactly that, a nice to have, not a need to have, not a critical competitive advantage, for example, or not essential to the success of their partners in the face of increasing disruption across every industry. Uh, secondly, you know, I, I think the teams responsible for deploying digital transformation solutions, oftentimes they kind of revert to or go to the same toolbox that they've been relying on for the past, you know, X number of years. So already right out of the gates, there's friction. And that's where sort of muscle memory and old habits kick in. And this, by the way, you know, says nothing about the project management, the tactical work, IT's seat and voice at the table at the earliest stages and other, you know, what I'd call just influencing factors. So the end result, you know, really is obvious. They, their back goes out uh, and in a manner of speaking because they didn't shift their perspective on how to do things differently this time. And as such, they throw more money and bodies at the problem. That's not a winning strategy. And a winning digital transformation strategy, it starts at the absolute earliest stages, even at the ideation stage, and requires the executive sponsor to be highly strategic and really challenge the status quo within their organization to avoid that muscle memory and those mistakes. Just as an example of that, Ben, um, you know, I think back, you know, maybe five or six years ago when, uh, I, you know, I was traveling and, and, you know, folks were like, well, people will never transact, you know, significant amounts of e-commerce on mobile devices. You know, they'll go, they'll wait to go to their, to their uh, uh, desktops. And, and I remember the, the first time I booked uh, a hotel room. Uh, on a mobile device, on, in, on, on an app. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the reason I did it was because, you know, I got halfway across the U.S. and realized I didn't have a hotel room for that night, and I was in an airport, and so I certainly wasn't going to pull out my laptop. And now look at where I am now, where that same hotel chain that I use as a loyal customer has made it so easy for me to, to book uh, that hotel room through the mobile app, uh, especially because all I've got to do is log on with Touch ID, that I now book the majority of my hotel rooms through the mobile applications as opposed to the desktop because the experience is now the easiest experience, even with the small screen size. And when I think back to a conversation that I had with that particular hotel chain, one of the things their digital leader said to me resonates, which is, you know, when we started running a billion dollars in bookings a year through the mobile app, our board started paying attention. You know, that's a real example of, you know, kind of identifying the right mobile moments that would move the needle and show results and then challenging the team to get there by starting to think from the beginning about what might be possible, even though when they started, people didn't do that on mobile. Yeah. Thank you both for that very interesting discussion. Uh, for our last data point, I'd like to discuss what our data showed, which is while digital leaders have launched mobile apps, and this I think relates back to what we were just discussing, they're not very bullish on the effectiveness of these mobile apps for meeting business goals. Specifically, 36 and 37% of digital leaders respectively said that the mobile apps that they currently offer are not at all or only somewhat effective at driving sales and engagement or in driving employee productivity through B2E applications. Ben, why might so many digital leaders only see limited gains from their existing mobile apps? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think a lot of mobile app projects in many organizations, this is not meant to be a sort of, you know, uh, applied to all organizations, but I think a lot of mobile app projects are, are merely checking the box, so to speak and not really solving the most important problems in the most effective ways. Um, you know, let's face it, I think digital leaders are, are as overwhelmed as anyone 
arguably more, given how fast things are moving and changing out there. But just deploying, say, you know, a responsive website uh, with a native wrapper isn't really deploying a fully functional mobile app that provides the kind of power and convenience that customers are actually looking for. I mean, it's checking the, we have a mobile app box, but what kind of engagement is the app getting? The analytics, assuming there are analytics, should tell the story pretty clearly. And, and again, it, it's kind of like the web some 20 years ago, having a website isn't enough. What value is your app supposed to provide? I mean, what's the objective and, and what's the real objective? Uh, is it, you know, conversions? Is it increased sales, customer loyalty? So, so just checking the box and launching an app is not enough in 2018 and 2019 and, and beyond. If the app is going to, you know, I don't know, better engage uh, a distributed workforce or better convert new customers, uh, you know, new users into customers or, or better enable partners, what are the value metrics and is it working? Is it contributing to those value metrics that are contributing to a broader vision that needs to be defined by that digital transformation leader? So, and I mean, it needs to do so in a, in a meaningful way. Is it delivering on the core promise? I also think it's, you know, really important to have that clearly stated core objective right up front. And that, that vision, if you will, is what informs um, what success looks like. And, and then that's easier said than done, of course, but it's, it's not enough to just check the box that says, okay, we have an app now and let's move on. Yeah, Ben, we call that uh, that checking the box phase, uh, uh, the shrink and squeeze phase, where the thinking is, how do I take my existing experiences and, and shrink them down uh, to the mobile platform? And in that world, you normally don't get the right mobile moments identified. So as an example, I think of a quick service restaurant that, that, that we've spent a little bit of time with in the past. And, you know, when you have just kind of a store locator and a menu on a mobile app, and it basically looks like the website it really doesn't move the needle because it doesn't provide a compelling experience. And, you know, why can't I just go to the browser on the mobile device and do the same thing? But when you take that same app and start to really think about the, the valuable mobile moments. So for example, I don't want to wait in line behind 17 people to pick up my coffee or my bagel in the morning, but if I can skip the line by ordering ahead with the mobile app, suddenly that becomes a pretty valuable valid use case. And now you've got revenue flowing through that application. If you take that to the next level and say, well, hey, we're going to introduce catering. Uh, and so you can make an order and we'll actually deliver it to your office so that uh, the bagels or the donuts or the coffee or the, or the the, uh, the croissants uh, appear for that, that 9 a.m. meeting that you have, that becomes even more valuable because I don't have to stop on my way and even more revenue begins flowing through the application. So moving beyond that, that shrink and squeeze thinking to the customer experience transformation is part of that key toward getting toward a level of digital transformation maturity that really moves the needle. Early on, we saw customer experience was one of the things that folks were trying to measure as a value of their mobile investments. Today, I really think you have to look at revenue and cost savings, hard metrics that allow you to prove the value of your mobile initiatives to justify the sort of ongoing investment they require to get one of those 50 to 100 places on your customer's mobile phone. That's good. Thanks for making me hungry. <laughs> Sorry. You need some order ahead functionality there, Ben. <laughs> Yeah, very, very interesting. Okay, thank you, Jeffrey and Ben. I, I really appreci appreciate both your insights on these data points. So now we're, we're very excited to move into the next part of our agenda. And I'm going to hand over the reins to our expert analyst, Jeffrey Hammond, as he takes us through some of his data that was gathered in the Forrester Global Mobile Executive Survey. And he'll talk us, he'll talk us through some of the digital challenges that he encounters every day dealing with clients, as well as some of the solutions that they're turning to. Jeffrey, take it away. Thanks a lot, Will. Um, so a couple things that I think lead to mobile being an Achilles heel. Number one, sometimes I think it's difficult for uh, leaders, C-levels, uh, to really understand the importance of mobile as part of that overall digital transformation initiative. What we see from our data when we survey uh, uh, leaders in, in larger companies, 250 employees or more, is that when we ask them about digital transformation and who's accountable for that, it tends to be a boardroom topic. Uh, the CEO is responsible for vision and often strategy. You've got your CMO or senior vice president of marketing uh, on down. 
But when we look at mobile and we ask the same question, uh, or you know, we ask whether or not they get mobile, while we see that senior leadership teams, 51% say that they get the importance of digital, that describes their company very well, and 29% give it a four, so you're, you're almost at 80% uh, percent there. When we ask the same question about mobile, we see that only 35% of the broad senior leadership team understands the importance of mobile. So there is a gap uh, there. Now, I think one of the reasons for that is that mobile tends to be owned below the C-suite. So while we do often have uh, it placed with a senior VP, maybe a VP of digital or a CDO, uh, it's just as often placed with a VP or a senior director that reports up. So there's a little bit of a gap in communication uh, and importance. And I think it's into that gap that often we find some of the issues with respect to resources. We find some of the gap with, the, with respect to the, the what is possible when you focus on a customer experience transformation as opposed to a, uh, a shrink and squeeze uh, type approach. So getting mobile elevated uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as a spear tip of digital as opposed to just one of the things that we have to worry about is one of the first ways that you get beyond mobile being an Achilles heel. Number two, we see that spend on mobile is fairly substantial. Almost two thirds of businesses that we survey on a yearly basis, uh, when we ask their, their digital leaders about their spend, spend at least a million dollars or more. 10% uh, spend between five to 10 million and 7% spend 10 to 20 million and 10% spend even 20 million a year or more. So there are some big spenders out there. Uh, and, and, and so it doesn't necessarily seem to be a problem, but, what we find with that money is while aspirationally, most organizations would like to be able to build internally, often those aspirations aren't matched with their ability to find uh, provision and use the right resources in an operational way. So when we survey those exact same um, leaders, about their mobile efforts, we find that only about a third uh, think that they have all the skills that they need to build, maintain, and analyze the results, the telemetry for mobile apps uh, for their customers. So almost two thirds spending more than a million dollars, only one third thinking that they have the resources adequate to do the job. So there's a spend gap and a talent gap here. When we look in particular at you know, how many people they have working on these mobile projects, we find that uh, half of them have under six full-time equivalents working on mobile from a digital business or commerce perspective. Uh, pretty hard to field more than one uh, mobile experience or application uh, with only six uh, FTEs in your digital commerce uh, function. And even fewer, um, more than half have under six full-time equivalents working on mobile from an IT or infrastructure services perspective. One of the things that we find is when you start talking about a customer experience transformation, the thing that's going to drive your digital transformation efforts, often that requires you to get access to data that's in your existing systems, your systems about your customers, your systems about your operational uh, uh, practices, uh, your systems that process transactions. That doesn't happen without access to data and APIs, and that doesn't happen without IT and infrastructure services participating in your mobile efforts. As a result, one of the things that we find is about two thirds of mobile leaders spend more than a million dollars uh, with outside uh, uh, solutions and professional services. Uh, so because they don't have the resources they need, they spend uh, to get those resources. And that can be a challenge because as we'll see in a few slides, uh, those resources can be fairly expensive. Uh, they can really eat up your budgets quickly. So the net result of the expectation, the spend, but the lack of resources is an app gap. What we see at our clients is that most of the funds that are available get spent on a single B2C application. And that's great, but there's so much more that can be done with mobile when you are talking about a digital transformation. Uh, there are apps to enable employees, whether it's clienteling if you're in retail, 
uh, whether it's concierge, if you're in travel and transportation, uh, whether it's in the manufacturing part of your business, if you are into uh, product uh, manufacturing, especially if you're doing smart products. Um, we find that uh, as a result of the lack of resources, uh, it's hard to update campaigns, add new features, create special purpose applications. Uh, it's tough to keep your apps discoverable in the app store and get high ratings if you've got no one to pay attention to what your customers say. Uh, if you're not regularly delighting them with new features. Um, as a result, we see almost no time spent on B2E and, and, and B2B applications in the mobile space um, and a lack of resources to integrate with that key backend data. Um, the net result of this is that most applications are not updated on a frequent basis and they move more toward that zombie end of the app spectrum as opposed to the one of 50 uh, that's going to be on your client's device. That is really, you know, the, the, the main meat of why we see the Achilles heel uh, in the mobile part of this, uh, of this problem equation. So how do we find that organizations combat that app gap? Uh, there are three common responses to it. You find and you hire more good mobile developers. Good luck with that. It can be a real challenge. Uh, folks hire digital agencies. They hire systems integrators. They essentially throw money at the problem to buy those resources. It's like a free agent strategy if you're the, uh, if you're the Yankees uh, and they get the best talent they can. Uh, or uh, they buy packages. Uh, they buy mobile applications that they can customize and they use what limited resources they have to customize those applications. Now, the problem with doing that is your competition can do the exact same thing in your industry uh, and they can also customize those applications. In some cases, uh, the vendor ends up taking the money from one vendor as part of that investment and using it to build features for the other vendor. So it becomes a little bit of an arms race. Now let's take a look at some of these things. Hiring new developers is easier said than done. Uh, when we pulled those uh, digital leaders and asked them about what keeps them from putting application updates out more often, uh, while well, about a third of them said, hey, we're doing okay, um, many of them said, we just don't have the resources. We can't update our backend infrastructure, so even if we had new features, we don't have the data that lights those features up, and we don't have the resources to do it. Um, we often find folks that say, hey, you know, our IT organization or the organization that owns developers uh, is, you know, a project-based organization. So we do a project, and then when that project's done, they get allocated to another project, and we can't get those uh, developers, designers, QA folks back. Uh, we find that there are a lot of process problems. They don't have the right skills. They don't uh, know how to prioritize the right features. Uh, they don't use an agile development process, so they can't do multiple updates in a year period. Lots of challenges uh, when it comes to just trying to grow uh, your talent base. However, uh, when we go to augment mobile efforts with consultants, uh, while we see uh, that a lot of firms have at least one and usually uh, uh, you know, somewhere between one and five or six to 15, that can also be expensive. If you look at how much is spent, 37% uh, of digital leaders spend at least a million dollars uh, on those external vendors uh, over a 12 month period. And if you break that down, you think, well, a million dollars goes a long way, but it really doesn't in the mobile space. One of the things that we did a couple years ago here at Forrester is we went out and surveyed a bunch of agencies, a bunch of global SIs, and asked them, well, how much do you charge on an hourly basis for design, development, and QA talent? Uh, if you want onshore talent that is close to you, uh, you're going to be paying probably $180 an hour on average for design, $170 an hour for development, $136 an hour uh, for testing. If you do the math, that works out to over $300,000 a year uh, for a nearshore mobile developer uh, full time. That's basically three devs and you're at that million dollar run rate. It's a little bit better if you go uh, um, offshore or, or go with one of the majors, uh, but even there, uh, your budgets get eaten up fast. So, you know, the traditional responses really give us no good <laughs> result. Uh, they're, they're all challenging. There is another option, and this is one that I'm beginning to see more of our clients uh, uh, working with, and that is to expand the development leverage of the talent they have uh, by helping them to do more uh, with low-code tools. If you're not familiar with low-code, we've been writing a lot about that at Forrester, uh, both in the mobile and the web space. Uh, essentially, low-code acts as a force multiplier for developers by letting them focus on the code that matters and generating a lot of the code uh, that doesn't. 
Um, there are lots of low-code tools out there in the space. They take many different approaches in terms of enabling developers. Uh, some of the things that low-code does that you should be looking for as part of that force enablement is uh, a faster development environment, a visual development environment, uh, automated tooling that helps developers quickly lay out the structure and organization of their applications integration with corporate data because data is one of those things that can make costs go nonlinear. Um, a full support for your application lifecycle for multiple developers to work uh, together to be able to version code, to be able to submit it uh, to an app store for, for publication, uh, making it easy to make changes to the applications and get them updated. Uh, deployment choice is an important one. Sometimes you will need to deploy backend infrastructure in your own uh, um, IT infrastructure. Other times you might want to use public clouds like Amazon or, or, or Google or, or Azure and having that choice is also important. An exit scaling or runtime strategy is also something that you need to, uh, to uh, think about because if you decide to stop licensing a tool, what happens to your application? Does your application go dead because you don't have access to the runtime? Do you have to rewrite your application? Um, and also what sort of cost do you have? Is it per user? Is it per application? Is it consumption based? Uh, your costs can, can really shift depending on what the, the low code vendor is, uh, is, is building into the, to their model. And, and that really is why you need to make sure you have a pricing model that makes sense with your deployment model. So do your due diligence, but understand that that fourth strategy, uh, the low code strategy that allows you to leverage the development resources you have is one of the ways to deal with closing the app gap that does create this Achilles heel. Will, thank you. I'm going to pass things back to you. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. That was very, very interesting. And we're seeing a lot of the same data in our interactions with our customers and, and users. Now I'm really excited to hear from JobSource CEO, Ben Saren. Ben is going to talk us through how digital leaders are now finding innovative ways to break through some of those long established barriers and achieve digital transformation success. Ben, you're up. Great, thank you, Will. So uh, as someone who um, has experienced both successes and failures in digital transformation, uh, and at times uh, some very painful and costly lessons, I'll contend that the most critical ingredient to successful digital transformation really comes down to one word, and that's culture. I think of culture, uh, and it's a bit of a metaphor, but it literally works, as the yeast that makes the bread rise, right? It, 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 yeast is critical. If the conditions are optimal, then the bread rises. And if the conditions are wrong, then the bread will not rise, and you'll end up with something much different than you intended. So my point as it pertains culture is that digital transformation is as much about the people and processes as it is about the technology. In fact, I'd argue that a successful digital transformation strategy hinges critically on the organization's cultural ability to change and adapt more than anything else. And not all companies are predisposed for innovation. So I'll talk briefly and in practical terms about how to lead by example to drive the right kind of cultural change. So first, and at a high altitude, and as I mentioned a few minutes ago, it's vital to establish a vision for success. And by this, I mean a bold vision for success that delivers on the change that your organization requires in its industry and competitive landscape. You know, the vision also has to critically tether to the key stakeholders. It has to give them something to really hook into. As a digital leader, it's important that you articulate a clear vision that not only can inspire your peers, many of whom undoubtedly will really need to buy in and even sign off, but also for other stakeholders who might not seem so obvious at first. And I'll use IT, broadly speaking, as an example, or your internal development teams, but I sort of use them both in the same, uh, so sort of broadly. So they also need a seat at the table. They're a critical stakeholder who need a seat at the table from the get-go, from the earliest stages. And I think you'll find that the sooner you involve them, the more effective your efforts will be. And furthermore, a, a central part of your vision must consider breaking the old paradigms, doing things less conventionally, considering new approaches, new tools and solutions that help you reach your vision. The conventional and traditional methods and means 
will not likely help you achieve the vision, at least not quickly or affordably. And, and managing this process is not easy within any organization. But the sooner that you introduce these new concepts for solving problems, the sooner your stakeholders will really buy into your vision and the smoother the road ahead will be. It's, it's going to be difficult to achieve buy-in of a bold vision if the default mindset is to use yesterday's methods and tools and yet expect tomorrow's results. These early and strategic steps will immediately test the waters internally and also externally, um, and, and also implicitly sort of challenge the status quo. And along the way, you'll quickly spot the potholes um, and the obstacles uh, as you travel the road ahead. Uh, you know, this is a, a classic expression. I think it was Henry Ford that coined it, but it's been associated with many people. Um, but, you know, a little bit lower in altitude now, I think it's important to make it real and have a realistic plan. And that sounds intuitive, right? Well, a realistic plan in today's modern organization also means challenging the status quo, because let's face it, every company has challenges and every company has its own bureaucracy to navigate. So no matter what your job title is, it's not easy to truly challenge the status quo and deliver on it. And that's why I believe that it's really important that in your march towards achieving buy-in to your vision, that you also create a sense of achievability, right? You've got to make it feel achievable. If stakeholders don't see a way out of the maze, they're going to struggle and they're going to sit in the boardroom with their arms crossed. So make it clear that achieving your vision is realistic, but critically that it will require doing things in new ways, ways that might not be the default in your organization. And this continues, or excuse me, this includes IT and your software development team, your web development team. Everyone needs to have an open mind. And the fact is, unless your organization is already setting the bar high for digital transformation and is, you know, leading your competitors or your industry, you're going to have to chart a new path forward. And the friction and the challenges that you're most likely to encounter will reveal themselves when the discussions jump ahead to mobilizing your precious internal IT and development resources. Meanwhile, you probably don't have IT and development staff just sitting idly by waiting for new projects. In fact, it's probably quite the opposite. So if you expect your vision to be achieved in the next decade, and you expect your mobile app, for example, to see the light of day, you'll really need to think about app development differently and, and really shift your perspective and shift the perspective of your peers. So, you know, hear me out for a second because I, I talked about it a few minutes ago and, you know, we've been down this road before. It's a movie we've seen already. And again, if you look back 15, 20 years ago when all organizations were rushing to get on the web and launch intranets and extranets and websites, and you're probably all shuddering at the thought of it uh, and immediately remembering mistakes that were made along the way, you might also remember that the conventional approach to web design and development was to hand design every pixel, manually write every line of code. And it took months and months, sometimes years, to deploy those web assets and the costs they were insane. And then along came the content management systems like WordPress or Drupal, Expression Engine, and Sitecore. And nowadays, the idea of hand designing and hand coding websites and web applications is nuts. It's the laggards way. So those who adopted those new methods and challenged the status quo were ultimately better off. Mobile low code solutions are the analog to this when it comes to mobile app development. And in 2018 and 2019, most organizations are taking somewhere between eight and 12 months to build a mobile app, just their first version of their first mobile app. And they're spending sometimes two, three, four hundred thousand dollars just to build and deploy that first version of the mobile app. And that's to say nothing of maintaining and expanding that app. And that also says nothing of their second app and their third app. So this is why I think so many organizations end up on their heels rather than on the balls of their feet and in an offensive posture. The conventional methods are just not sustainable. So there's also been a lot of tech media coverage in the last couple of years, including a report that I saw recently from Stripe, the payments company. Uh, it was in September that it came out and uh, it was called the developer coefficient. And it talked about the challenges of attracting, retaining and getting the most out of their development teams. There's overwhelming data that the developers in every organization are overworked, under-resourced, 
and mostly focused on maintaining old code and legacy systems. And one stat from the Stripe report indicated that, quote, bad code is costing companies $85 billion annually. So the conditions aren't exactly favorable for digital leaders. There's almost a, a, a cognitive dissonance in what digital leaders critically need to get done and what's actually achievable within the organizations using the conventional methods. And at DropSource, we propose taking a lean, iterative, and incremental approach. And this keeps it simple, makes it realistic, and achievable. And it really starts with a proof of concept. For digital leaders with hot digital transformation priorities, the data that I just showed presents that conundrum. And as such, new and radical approaches must be considered. New paradigms have to be created, and it's on you, digital leaders, to do just that. So rather than taking the traditional and conventional approaches and say, you know, you got, to, you got what feels like buy-in and then you jump right into the full application development process or the SDLC, the software development life cycle, and then mobilizing precious and overwhelmed internal resources, instead, take a lean and iterative approach and start with a proof of concept. And, and bear with me here for a second. I think this is akin to like a clay model of a concept car that an auto might, maker might have. They don't start with a sketch and then jump right into ordering raw materials and deploying factory workers. Instead, they start with a clay model of the concept car that the executives and stakeholders and you know, potential buyers can look at, walk around, touch and feel. And it gives everyone a chance to ask questions and really buy in. This gets them excited. And this step, providing a proof of concept, should do one thing and one thing only. It should get them excited about your vision and make it real for them. A proof of concept of a mobile app is more than just mock-ups or designs. Like a clay model of a car, you should be able to install the proof of concept on their smartphone uh, and demonstrate how the app is gonna look, how it's gonna feel and function, what the user experience will be like. And most importantly, how is it going to deliver on the most essential and core value? Make it interactive. Like a clay model of a concept car though, which you know, won't include a navigation system and cup holders, your proof of concept should highlight only those most important features, functionalities, and that user experience for delivering that core and essential value proposition for the app. So sharpen your focus to the most essential transactional components of your app idea. And critically, don't get too hung up on the technical details at this stage. Don't worry, you know, I don't know, for example, about how you're going to facilitate, say, mobile payments uh, using Apple Pay. Don't worry about that right now. That's all solvable. Putting, doing that is, is sort of like putting the cart before the horse. So all that stuff, all that technical stuff is achievable. And DropSource makes all those functionalities really easy. The objective here, though, is to create something of a distilled example of how the app will look and function and deliver value for its users and for the organization. Now, using drop source for your proof of concept is an excellent choice for building your proof of concept to achieve these objectives and without compromises, and without sacrifices. You can have a proof of concept on your own phone in a matter of days, if not hours, using drop source. And that proof of concept version of the app can be simulated either you know, with drop source on an iPhone or Android device simulator right in your browser, or again, better yet, you can actually install that POC um, on your own phone or on your colleagues' phones without even having to go through the app store. So once your proof of concept has been bought into, the next step is to start iterating your way towards an MVP or a minimally viable product and ultimately continue iterating your way towards a general release. So now that you've got buy-in and feedback, you can continue on this path with drop source and start iterating your way towards that minimally viable product. And again, don't rush headstrong into that conventional app development process. That's a recipe for disaster. Define your MVP by prioritizing those most essential features and functionalities that you cannot live without in order to deliver on that application's core value proposition. And be really sharp in how you prioritize these features and functionalities. And look at them through the lens of what will directly contribute to achieving that vision that you established and contribute to the success metrics therein. And if your proof of concept was built in drop source, you can easily continue using drop source to get to an MVP. And this is where you'll, where you'll start to, uh, you know, need to start considering your backend systems for things like taking payments or integrating your product catalog or your order management system. 
And for these things, all you need is an API, which you can easily connect to drop source to start working with your, your data systems and really make your app come to life. And once you've built your MVP, you can also deploy it on drop source to a discrete number of customers, for example, who may have raised their hands and be interested in what you have, or who might be willing to help test it and provide feedback. And you can involve your other internal stakeholders, whether it's the sales team or the order management and uh, order processing team. Uh, get the MVP of the app though, get it on their devices and let them play with it for a few days. Now, it's critical at this point too, to not expect to hit a home run with your MVP. That's not the point. Um, the point here is to iterate your way to the final product, validating your value proposition for your users and stakeholders at each step of the way. So be iterative. And in baseball terms, and while Jeffrey mentioned the Yankees, I would be remiss if I didn't mention my, my, my uh, Red Sox. So it's like small ball, right? It's how the World Series was won, yet again, by my Boston Red Sox. And as you iterate your way and get closer to your vision, you'll find yourself squarely on the path to success and in fifth gear. You're not even going to be able to get off this path at this point. You'll be smooth sailing. So before you know it, the first version of your new mobile app can be up in the App Store, or if you have a mobile device manager within your organization, you can deploy it there and have it in your customers' hands. And with DropSource, you're also getting truly native mobile apps for iOS and Android. And from that's not just the functionalities that you need in your app, but it's also the computer generated and bug free Swift and Java code that DropSource automatically generates. You know, we've seen customers reduce their mobile app uh, time to market by as much as 80% from upwards of a year in some cases to just a few weeks. What was the key to their success? They were bold in their approach. They created a new paradigm. So be prepared to challenge the status quo. Be bold. Be prepared to shift not only your own perspective, but also those who have a seat at the table. And in my experience, people respond best to disrupting the status quo when they see a vision, a plan for success, and they know that you're also going to advocate and employ unconventional means for achieving the end result. If you lead them, they will follow you. Will you make mistakes? Of course you will. But importantly, those mistakes will not be costly mistakes if you're lean and agile and adaptable in your approach and are bold in your approach. Digital transformation when done right really requires that shift in perspective and it asks digital leaders to be fast, fearless and flexible. Well, thank you, Ben, and thank you, Jeffrey. Really appreciate everything that we've heard so far today. It's been a very insightful and thought-provoking discussion. Uh, so now we are coming to the end of our webinar, so I want to open it up for our questions uh, from our attendees so we can hear from you. Please go ahead and put your questions into the chat widget in your screen. Uh, questions such as, what are you curious about in terms of digital transformation challenges that you're facing? What questions might you have about the future of mobile development or in the power of low code? If you would, please post your questions in the chat and we only have enough time to get to maybe one or two. But if we don't get to your questions today live on, on the webinar, we will follow up with you over email. All right, to kick things off, we've had a question sitting here that I wanna to get to. Jeffrey, what is the most critical piece of advice you give to a digital leader heading into 2019? Um, it would be that uh, you need to make smart, flexible technology decisions. We see uh, lots of interesting um, things changing uh, in the space. You're starting to see voice technology driving uh, applications. You're starting to see uh, agents. Uh, you're starting to see immersive technology like AR Core and AR Kit. Uh, so make sure that when you make information available, you plan to make it available in a way that it can surface in potentially lots of different ways uh, from a usability standpoint. Okay, Ben, uh, we, we've got a question here. Did we actually reach a conclusion on the topic of the webinar? Is mobile, in fact, the Achilles heel or the key to digital transformation? Yeah, um, well, I, I, I think we did. Um, I think in many ways, in most ways, that, that uh, it's the Achilles heel. Um, I think it's so expected by everybody, your employees, management, your partners, your customers, most importantly, your customers, if not demanded. Uh, so I think failure to deploy uh, mobile is the Achilles heel for sure. All right, great. Well, we are actually out of time, so we'll have to get to these other questions in a uh, follow-up session. 
So now that concludes today's webinar. Mobile is the Achilles heel or the key to digital transformation. I'd like to thank our panelists, Jeffrey Hammond and Ben Saren for their expert analysis and experiences. Thank you both very much for joining us today. I'd also like to thank you, our attendees and audience for joining us live here on this session and for your insightful questions. And again, I'm sorry we didn't have more time to get to more of those, but we will follow up. Please note that you will be receiving a follow-up email from us, which will include today's slides and a link to the recording of today's webinar. Feel free to share that far and wide. And we'll also share links to the digital leader report that we discussed live during the webinar and a case study section so that you can hear more about how DropSource has helped its customers. We encourage everyone to explore that report and case studies so that you can see how digital leaders are overcoming real life mobile challenges with the next generation mobile logo. Again, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us today, and we'd encourage everyone to get in touch to learn how low code can help your organization ignite their digital transformation. Have a great day, everyone, and again, thank you.